Um, thank you, everyone. It is now 8.17 my time, 11.17 East Coast time, and we will now reconvene the meeting to begin our public comment period. I'd like to welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. All the speakers today submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited uh, public comment period, and in order to make it through all of the listed speakers, it is extremely important each speaker limits his or her remarks to three minutes. We will be displaying a timer on the screen so you know how much time you have left. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, and we look forward to your comments. So our first uh, public commenter for today um, is Ms. Erica Pedinaro. Ms. Pedinaro? Ms. Pedinaro, are you on the line? She's on, the mic is open. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Pedinaro, you may begin. Can you hear me? We can, thank you very much. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Erica Pedinaro. I am the president of a 501c4 nonprofit organization called Informed Choice Michigan. Uh, it seems we have been at a crossroads between public health and personal choice for some years, but especially now in these unprecedented times where nearly everywhere we go, if you're not wearing a face mask, we're considered a health threat. Employers in schools are forcing strict testing, contact tracing, and mask requirements, all while violating the Americans with Disability Act for not accommodating those who cannot medically tolerate face coverings. All of this along with the fact that several states have lost their medical freedoms in recent years, specifically when it comes to vaccinations, parents and families have hit the streets in an effort to protect their rights. People from all across the world have been standing up for their freedoms and rights to not be forced to undergo a medical procedure that is not a one-size-fits-all shot. I'm not going to sit here and talk about all of the risk of these vaccines because you already know them, but I am here to tell you, we know too and we will not forget what you do here today. We will not be going away and you cannot ignore us. History loves to repeat itself. And just like during the Nuremberg trials, everyone involved will be held accountable for their actions. For those listening, I would like to say this. What this committee decides on today will be the recommendations for your children. These recommendations could have huge impacts on how schools proceed with mandates. Many may think, Mandatory vaccination laws don't affect me, but if you don't want a flu shot, this affects you. If you don't want your child getting the HPV vaccine, this affects you. If you don't want a COVID-19 vaccine, this affects you. It is your right to choose what is medically done to your body and your children's bodies. And that is at risk of being taken away from you. Even if you do choose to vaccinate, you have that choice. Vaccine mandates mean you won't ever get that choice. Vaccine mandates also pave the way for other medical care mandates. We are not a communist socialist country and medical mandates do not belong here. We, the people, will continue to fight for our rights and the rights of all Americans. And I will end my comment by saying this to the committee. You know all of the risks of these vaccines. You know kids are at minimal risk of this disease. So what would you do if it were your child? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We will move on to Dr. Linda Wastila. Good morning. I am Dr. Linda Wastila, a professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Trained as a pharmacist, I have a master's in public health and a doctorate in health policy. For 30 years, I've conducted, conducted federally funded research on outcomes associated with unintended consequences of pharmaceutical policy. My views today are my own. I'm speaking today about the booster authorization and why I object to such authorization now. They fall under four domains, safety, effectiveness, availability, and necessity. For safety and effectiveness, please review the written comments submitted to the committee of my colleagues, Steve Kirsch and David Weissman for excellent detailed documentation of their concerns. One, safety. As of August 30, there have been, as of August 20th, there have been 13,627 deaths and nearly 56,000 hospitalizations associated with these products reported to VAERS. Is there any evidence that FDA and CDC have staffed up to deal with this explosion of reports? 
Who is following up with patients and providers to fill in the necessary details? Many reported serious adverse effects were never captured in clinical trials. Has the ACIP ever recommended a vaccine known to cause myocarditis, appendicitis, and shingles, three serious side effects which didn't show up in the phase three trials? Effectiveness. Waning immunity is the elephant in the room. Boosters are being justified on antibody data from the manufacturers. It is becoming obvious that antibody data isn't predictive of actual clinical outcomes. Do current vaccines even deliver 50% efficacy over a season? Pfizer's six-month RCT preprint shows waning efficacy as early as March, well before Delta emerged. We didn't learn about waning immunity until real-world evidence this summer from Israel, Provincetown, and the UK, which showed that vaccinated make up growing proportions of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Indeed, as of August 15th, 514 Israelis were hospitalized with severe or critical COVID-19. Of these, 59% were fully vaccinated. Please stop lying that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It is a pandemic of everyone. The correlates of protection remain complex and unknown. Availability. On Monday, the FDA released two letters, a BLA full approval for Come Here Naughty and a two-year extension of the EUA. Boosters fall under the two-UA EUA extension, not the fully approved version, of which we actually have no supply in the United States. If authorized, individuals receiving boosters will not receive Come Here Naughty, and indeed no one will, even though the vast majority of Americans believe they're receiving an FDA-approved product. Necessity. There is overwhelming evidence that natural immunity is robust and longer lasting than vaccine induced immunity. CDC estimates that 32 to 43% of Americans have already been infected. How can we ignore this very basic scientific precept that natural immunity trumps all when considering boosters? Do not do so borders on public health mass practice. Given the rising numbers of deaths and serious side effects, lock lack of long-term safety data, and significantly waning effectiveness of these products, how can we, in good conscience, recommend a third dose to healthy people? For your comment, your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We will move on to Ms. Elizabeth Faber. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Elizabeth Faber, and I'm the director of Iowa Immunizers the statewide immunization coalition of individuals and organizations committed to protecting the health of Iowans through vaccination of children and adults. In recent years, Iowa has been directly impacted by the politicization of vaccines, and it has affected our work greatly. We have seen an increase of bills introduced in our state legislature that are designed to weaken Iowa's immunization law. In fact, in recent years, this has more than tripled from under five bills introduced three years ago to over 20 this past session. Immunization advocates and public health officials are spending valuable time and resources responding to false misinformation and educating policymakers on the importance of immunization. Discredit of the healthcare and public health profession throughout this pandemic has impacted our workforce, leaving our communities vulnerable to not only the next virus, but also to other public health issues. Data show that public health officials are experiencing mental health issues at higher rates than healthcare professionals. Not only are they living and working the pandemic, but they are trying to change it as well. This reduces the time they are able to encourage the uptake of other important recommended immunizations. Also, if we are seeing adults in our country hesitant to get vaccinated against COVID-19, this reduces our confidence that they will be rushing to vaccinate their children when it becomes approved. Not only am I a public health professional, but I am a mother to four children two that have been vaccinated against COVID-19, and two that are not yet eligible. Here in Iowa, we are starting our second week of school in our children's hospitals are at capacity. We stand with the AAP in the urgency of approving a vaccine for age five and above. However, not only am I concerned for my own children's health, but I'm also worried that their friends will not be vaccinated due to their parents' hesitancy. This hesitancy in the COVID-19 vaccine may lead to reduced trust in the science for all recommended immunizations. We need to build that trust back up. On the federal level, policymakers also need to realize that they are increasing mistrust in vaccines by getting ahead of the science. We must let FDA, ACIP, and CDC do their work without political influence. Thanks again to all of you for your service and dedication to keeping all Americans healthy. You are appreciated. Thank you for your comments. Um, Next is Ms. Patricia Neuenschwander. Good morning, can you hear me? We can, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me uh, the opportunity to make a public comment. My name is Patricia Neuenschwander and I've been a nurse for over 26 years. I and other medical providers count on the CDC for guidance and wisdom. We don't have time to review all the studies and information. 
the FDA has let us down. After promising transparency in August of 2020, they approved this vaccine without any input from the public or the VRBAC committee. ASAP and the CDC now is the only thing that stands in the way of this vaccine being unleashed on the public as an approved vaccine. It is very disappointing to me that we are expected to make a public comment before we even see the science other than the data presented by Dr. Perez from Pfizer. The public comment session is being held before you present the safety data, such as the information from the vaccine safety data link and the VAST data that reviews the post authorization vaccine safety data, which are not publicly available. The benefit risk discussion and the GRADE study and the evidence to recommendation framework are also being discussed after public comment. The only gold standard randomized placebo controlled trials and science that we have is from a preprint not yet peer reviewed with a study uh, data cutoff of March 13, 2021, over five months ago, and does not include any data on the Delta variant. No randomized controlled trials evaluated asymptomatic SARS-CoV infection. Weekly testing of both groups to evaluate the true infection rate of the virus and therefore the ability to transmit to others have not taken place. In the preprint study during the blinded period, only 51% of the participants had data for four to six months post second dose. And only 8% of the vaccine recipients and 6% of the placebo had greater than six months of post follow-up after dose two. The article shows waxing immunity down 83 to 83.7% at four months. They didn't even give us the percentage of the numbers at six months. With the current Delta variant, the CDC's own numbers are suggesting the efficacy rates are down to 50% per the MMRWR article from the last two to three weeks. With the Delta variant outbreaks having 74% of the cases in fully vaccinated people. There were only two studies that evaluated the serious adverse events with an unvaccinated comparator, both by Pfizer, both from unpublished data. Your decision will be used to support mandates throughout this country. You should make it clear that this vaccine, at best, lessens the symptoms of COVID, does not stop the transmission of the virus. You should make it clear that it's a personal choice to take this vaccine and not a matter of public health. This committee needs to make it clear that natural immunity is far superior to any vaccine immunity. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, we will move on to Gina Harrison. Harrison, are you on the line? I don't see her, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we will um, come back to Ms. Harrison, uh, and the next public commenter is Ms. Catherine Falk. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Catherine Falk, and I'm a parent and vaccine advocate in Oakland, California. I really appreciate the committee's hard work during what seems like ever more challenging times. Last time I was given the opportunity to make a comment here, I said, I encourage the committee to address the problem of misinformation as much as possible, particularly as it impacts populations that have historical trauma. Many of these conversations are going to have to take place within communities rather than outsiders lecturing, but if the leaders in those communi communities can be empowered with resources, that would be very helpful. I also hope that the guidance on how to allocate vaccines can include a conscious, deliberate effort to avoid reinforcing systemic racism and existing inequities. As the committee moves ahead on the COVID vaccine for those 16 and up and starts discussing booster doses, the problems I mentioned are unfortunately still very much still with us. In Alameda County, where I live, communities of color continue to be hit extremely hard with the disease. Most of the COVID patients are Hispanic, a medical professional acquaintance who works with local hospitals tells me. Our local TV station had a heartbreaking story this week of a family sickened with the Delta variant, which killed the head of the household at age 53, the day after his wedding anniversary, and left his widow needing ongoing mechanical assistance to breathe. One of his daughters had tried to convince him to get the vaccine earlier, before it was too late, but misinformation got to him first. And I checked Facebook last night and saw that a friend in West Berkeley had posted about the deaths of three of her neighbors, all, un all unvaccinated, all in the same family. 
One of them had earlier expressed fear of the vaccine to her. I ask the committee to do what you can to mitigate the pandemic of misinformation that is literally killing people and encourage the allocation of resources to help with outreach. While boosting the immunity of those who already got the vaccine is important, we also really need to boost access and trust. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Dr. Stanley Plotkin. Dr. Plotkin. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. We can hear you now. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, um, well, I, you know, after hearing some of the prior comments, uh, I move to remind you that there is no vaccine against stupidity. But um, the point of what I wanted to say was that um, I, I would not uh, uh, call the third dose a booster. Uh, in fact, if you uh, look at other uh, inactivated vaccines, uh, you will uh, recognize that uh, at least four to six months are necessary for optimal priming. In other words, for converting B cells to plasma cells so that you have permanent production of antibody. So uh, I would recommend that, that <laughs> In effect, one stop using the term booster because the third dose of the vaccines against COVID-19 uh, really will give a much longer persistence of uh, antibody immunity. Uh, and indeed, uh, antibodies are clearly the correlate of protection uh, against uh, COVID-19. So the, the third doses really should have been part of the plans for the use of, 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 of inactivated vaccines. So I hope you will, when you come to consider the third doses, that you will approve them as being part and parcel of the use of these vaccines to give uh, prolonged and uh, broadened immunity against uh, against other strains besides the original uh, um, uh, uh, SARS-2 virus. So that is the message I w wish to convey uh, to the committee, and thank you very much. Thank you much, very much for your comments, Dr. Plotkin. We will move on to Dr. Edward Nirenberg. Uh, sorry, I'm not a, a doctor, actually, but... Um... No worries. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I, I do want to thank the members of the committee for their tireless service. It's extremely trying time, especially given <clears throat> some of the recent public comments that were just absolutely detached from reality. And I really do second everything that Dr. Plotkin has just said. Uh, I come to you today with several concerns. Firstly, I do want to state publicly that it is not appropriate for the White House to issue boost recommendations before ACIP does. We have expert committees for a reason, and I expect this to respect the process and listen to the committees. On the matter of boosters, there is presently a paucity of clinical data. We are relying very substantially on surrogate markers of protection like antibody titers, and we seem to be offering considerable deference to PCR positivity as a metric for vaccine effectiveness, which is neither meaningful nor reasonable in isolation. Effectiveness of the vaccines against severe disease remains extremely well preserved. We really need to clarify what the goals of our campaign against COVID-19 are, because as things stand now, it essentially looks as though we are trying to stamp out any COVID-19 uh, case. And that goal is not reasonable or realistic. And furthermore, in pursuing it, we are flouting our obligation to vaccine equity for the entire world. It's immensely concerning to me that throughout much of the world, there isn't a healthcare infrastructure that can handle the burdens of COVID-19. There aren't adequate means to enforce non-pharmaceutical interventions. And in Elmix, Approximately 1% of people have maybe had one dose of vaccine, and here we are considering offering third doses to the general public. Now, of course, there are certain members of society for whom third doses absolutely are appropriate and make sense, uh, but ultimately, the great danger here is unmitigated spread of SARS CoV 2 throughout the world that drives the evolution of variants that are more transmissible and more potentially virulent. And that isn't merely a humanitarian issue because it's a matter of our own safety as well. 
Uh, furthermore, one group that has been particularly left behind since you know, are the recipients of the Anson vaccine and data to inform recommendations for heterologous theories or even homologous boosting, I understand, is minimal. At the same time, though, we do have data uh, showing that heterologous theories with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine appear to be both safe and effective. And given the extraordinary spread of SARS-CoV-2 presently and the results of the Sasanki study, I'm once again requesting that guidance be issued for additional doses for these individuals, many of whom are higher risk and select the one dose option because of constraints of access. Finally, I do wish to once again note that the situation with children is still of exigent concern and the inability to vaccinate those under 12 is a major problem in attempting to ensure a safe return to school. The recent evidence of UR describing the Marin County outbreak by the Delta variant showed astonishingly high transmission and it's caused for important and difficult conversations about how we can keep schools safe for children and for the community at large. While we can vaccinate everyone over the age of 12 and reduce COVID-19 in the community, we can't be so naive as to think that it's compensates for keeping a group of 20 to 40 kids clustered together in a poorly ventilated, unhumidified space for hours where distancing is impossible and masking is not permitted. I'm once again asking the committee to do all within its means to encourage FDA to accelerate review of these vaccines for children under age 12. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Leah Rusin. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This is uh, Leah Russin, and thank you for your public health work. I'm a mother of a baby who was born three days after shelter in place started and two school-aged children. I'm also the director of an advocacy group called Vaccinate California. I encourage you to support efforts to communicate clearly and accurately about science-based public health policy. Your work here has to be understood by the public. We've seen that today in comments. Important decisions like recommendations for school and participation in society turn on what you recommend today. It is thus imperative that our public health institutions speak candidly and clearly, understanding that many people are, are easily misled by disinformation. It is no longer enough just to get the science right. The communication needs the same level of attention and care, and that must be part of your mandate. Additionally, please do all you can to speed approval of COVID vaccines for children. My son's elementary school has already endured multiple exposures in the first weeks of school and testing is now taking three days or longer. Make vaccines for this group, age five and up, a top priority and make it clear that children attending in-person school or other activities should be vaccinated. COVID boosters, please con communicate who needs them and when clearly, this goes back to the communication effort encourage Johnson & Johnson to present their data on a second dose as soon as possible. I saw an elderly black man receive seeking a booster be turned away at Walgreens because he had previously received J&J. &J. He later told me his doctor had sent him for a booster because he's immunocompromised. That is exactly the target community we need to be emphasizing our efforts on. And he had made the effort to show up for his booster but it is not yet approved because of a number of miscommunication efforts in the public health system. I hope the failures of communication from the many health entities don't undermine his faith and that he does show up again if and when a booster is approved for him. Other diseases, please don't forget about them. We've seen a surge in RSV this year. Please encourage rapid development of a vaccine for RSV and a better flu vaccine. We now know how fast companies can move when properly incentivized. Please encourage renewed vigor to develop a safe and highly effective vaccine for these as well as other diseases. Thank you. In the words of Ted Lasso, I appreciate you. Thank you for your comments. Um, we will move on to Dr. Elias Cass. Hi, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Dr. Elias Cass. I am a licensed naturopathic physician in Seattle, Washington, working in pediatric primary care and vaccine hesitancy. I'm the father of two children, both of whom are in the car, one of whom is two days away from first grade. He spent his kindergarten year with headphones and a school-issued iPad, attending meetings from a daycare while I worked full-time in clinic. Parents are understandably frustrated to have had their kids sit out for a year and a half of Alpha variant only to have their kids go back to schools full of Delta. Every day I get messages asking indirectly or directly about off-label use of the vaccine for their kids. In Washington, we are fortunate to be in a state with a solid commitment to public health, with mask mandates and with vaccine mandates for many professions. But millions of kids are walking into schools without masks, surrounded by adults who may or may not be vaccinated and without the opportunity to become vaccinated themselves. Or they're just not going to school because their families can't bear the risk of them becoming infected. 
I implore you to acknowledge the urgency of vaccines for kids under 12 and to convey that urgency to the FDA. Pediatric cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are on the rise, but parents are stuck trying to divine a timeline from the tea leaves of media interviews. From a statistical perspective, vaccine availability for kids under, for kids under 12 would substantially lower the effective reproduction number. There are roughly 48 million unvaccinated people in this group alone, 15% of the entire population. We know the trials are underway, but we also know the trials are substantially larger and longer than the trials were for expanding to adolescents. The FDA might consider issuing emergency use authorization in a rolling fashion, for example, authorizing 11-year-olds when the data is available without waiting for the entirety of the trial down to five years old. 11-year-olds are particularly vulnerable, as many are unvaccinated sixth graders in middle schools, and the FDA sh should commit to expedited review of the data as it becomes available. We need to know that our kids matter as much as the adults we kept them at home to protect. And while we're all focused on the wave of COVID-19 bearing down on us, we're already drowning in RSV and influenza is looming on the horizon. We're always eager to hear about updates in active immunization for RSV and progress in a universal influenza vaccine. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I'm gonna to return to Ms. Gina Harrison to see if Ms. Harrison's on the line. I don't believe I see her. Um, so I wanna thank our public comment speakers again. Um, I also just wanna take a moment to uh, acknowledge, and my apologies for not doing this earlier, that um, Dr. Thomas Weiser from uh, Indian Health Services and Patsy Stinchfield from uh, NAPNAP is, uh, they're both on the line and are present, and I had just forgotten to get to them earlier. So thank you for joining. Um, and the committee will now recess until, um, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, be online soon. <laughs>